Today I'll be discussing William Faulkner's Absalom Absalom, a novel published in 1937. Many critics claim that Absalom Absalom encompasses all that Faulkner has to say about the American South, and I would largely agree. To be clear, this lecture will glance over the novel's plot line, but I'd particularly like to focus on some deeper issues surrounding the character of Rosa Coldfield, the bitter spinster, and the mock heroically named Confederate Poet Laureate within the text. Faulkner's characterization of Rosa, and indeed nearly all of his female characters, has generated a steady stream of feminist criticism since the 1960s. People admire her, disdain her, and question her, arguably more than any other woman in Faulkner's numerous works. And it's important to question, why is this so? Most feminist scholars say that Rosa's voice is shut up by the men around her. As we can read on page 8 of the vintage edition of the novel, the main character in Absalom Absalom, Quentin, allows Rosa's words to, quote, just vanish, nodding every once in a while, but clearly blocking out her, quote, grim, haggard, amazed voice. Similarly, Quentin's roommate, Shreve, constantly dismisses Rosa's narrative authority by, quote, misnaming her multiple times. He calls her, on page 176, for example, this old dame, this old gal, Aunt Rosa, this Aunt Rosa, the old dame, the Aunt Rosa, at various points in the novel. Shreve, Quentin, and another character, Mr. Compson, largely take over Rosa's voice even as she's speaking. So what we see here is Rosa's lack of narrative authority. Uh, most read her lost voice as a symptom of the American South's patriarchal ways. She represents the archetypal uh, virginal woman for whom men in the antebellum South raise their wine glasses and salute. She's there to kind of fit apart, but really doesn't have to say, uh, doesn't have a say in the male-dominated culture around her. What I'd like to show in this lecture, however, is that Southern patriarchy may not be the only explanation for Rosa's lost voice. I'd particularly like to question why Faulkner dubs her, on page 11, Yoknamatafa County's own poetess laureate, someone who creates words, someone who creates thoughts, but later he silences her. Initially, this doesn't seem to make sense. Why would Faulkner give her the passion for verse, only to shut her up in the text? In his 1950 um, Nobel Prize banquet speech, Faulkner said that, quote, the poet's voice serves not only as, quote, the record of man, but also as one of the props, the pillars to help him endure and prevail. Here, Faulkner inherently claims that to be a poet is to possess historical or sociocultural authority. So again, it's very curious, given his abundant faith in the poet, that he aligns Rosa with this ability to prop up society. And she hasn't just written a poem or two. Faulkner describes her as a prolific poet of Dickinsonian proportions. We found out that she's written, quote, a thousand or more poems, and this is particularly astounding because we have no samples of her work within the text. Faulkner gives us no examples of her verse, effectively belittling it, and when current scholars discuss Rose's poetry, the consensus seems to be that it wasn't worth reading in the first place. For example, in his 1970 Shenandoah essay titled The Poetry of Miss Rosa Coldfield, Clenneth Brooks excuses Faulkner from this blatant omission, saying in what I would imagine to be a haughty tone that, quote, it is all too easy to imagine the banal and hackneyed quality of Miss Rosa's verse tributes to Confederate soldiers. And the analysis, in almost all cases, ceases there. It's enough to silence Rosa, to deem her poetry frivolous, more emotional than historical, and generally inconsequential to the overarching plot of Absalom Absalom. If anything, contemporary feminist scholars maintain, the exclusion of her verse represents yet another woman's failed search for a way into the patriarchy in the antebellum South. Yet again, I don't think this is the only way to look at it. Rose's poetry says something other than she's a woman in a man's world, and the absence of her poetry says something other than it wasn't worth reading. I think that her poetry, and furthermore the absence of her poetry, connects her to the Confederate lost cause. In fact, she personifies the trampled hopes of the Confederacy in every fiber of her being. It's important to remember that Rosa is the only living narrator in Absalom Absalom, who is also a participant in the Sutprint story, the only living link between the Civil War experience and the 20th century narrative present. And Faulkner, as many of you know, is obsessed with the past. So having a character who's able to navigate between the two time periods is extremely beneficial to the storyline. As early as 1963, Doug Douglas Miller observed that, quote, in the broadest sense of most Faulkner's fiction is concerned with the defeat of the South or the effect of that defeat. And Rosa fetishizes this lost cause and fixates on the Confederacy's collapse. 
On page 38, we read that, quote, The first of the odes to Southern soldiers in that portfolio, which when Quinton's grandfather saw it in 1885, contained a thousand or more, was dated in the first year of her father's involuntary incarceration and dated at two o'clock in the morning. Here, one learns that her poetic career appropriately began in, 19, in 1861, the first year of the American Civil War. Contemplating Absalom Absalom in the 1930s, Faulkner was undoubtedly influenced by attempts to return to that mythic pre-war South. Only six years before the novel's publication, in fact, did the Southern Agrarians publish their regionally focused manifesto, I'll Take My Stand. Imagining Rose into being, then, Faulkner possessed a definite picture of those 19th century remnants that trickled into the 20th. So what does he do? He makes this lost cause metaphorical. It's not enough to say that, confe that the Confederacy was defeated, so he situates this demonstrable absence within Rosa herself. On page 7, we see Rosa sitting in her father's study wearing, quote, eternal black. Here, Faulkner's portrayal of Rosa poetry as lost mirrors her dingy physical being. Her attire, her dark garb, and quote, unmoving triangle of dim lace signals not only her spinsterhood, but also conveys the perpetual state of mourning for the Confederacy. She dresses for an allegorical funeral that, given her disintegrating appearance, occurred before the turn of the century. Everything just seems dead and is incredibly uncanny. Eternally still, she's like a corpse in, quote, black which did not even rustle. She is, she is death, and furthermore, the death of the Old South incarnate. Quote, the dim, hot, airless room, end quote, with blinds tightly closed and doors locked, seems to be Rose's tomb. I would argue that this death, this embodiment of the lost cause, is in many uh, ways connected to the erasure of Confederate print culture during and after the Civil War. In the introduction to his 1865 edition of The Poetry of War, Oliver Wendell Holmes tries to convince his audience that, quote, there has been a great deal of good re readable verse and some genuine poetry written during the past four years under the inspiration of the times through which we have passed, end quote. But others passionately disagree. Many critics claim that there was too much poetry produced during the conflict, and most of it, it seems, wasn't very good. In 1863, for example, George W. Bagby remarked in his Southern Literary Messenger, quote, we are receiving too much trash and rhyme. So here we see the emphasis on quantity over quality, and this corresponds with Rosa's, quote, a thousand or more poems. The quality of her verse doesn't really seem to matter. Poets were encouraged to structure their verse around the Confederate cause, and their quick outpourings were products of a literary culture written for a vanishing present. Once the new nation was unrestrained politically, the South genuinely believed that it would grow uniquely national literature. Confederate leaders envisioned um, a regional unification through a shared Southern print culture. But this hope of a uniting classical age soon imploded. The new nation never came to be at all, so these grand plans were ruined. Even the materiality of Confederate literature during the war was fleeting and quickly vanished. In 1863, hampered by a scarcity of equipment, ink, and paper, the notable Southern publisher, S.H. Goetzel, was, quote, routinely printing books and wallpaper covers. And by the war's end, the state of the presses mirrored the economic and social condition of the Confederacy. Both were in shambles. Everyone knows the phrase, to the victor goes the spoils. And this was really the case with the American Civil War and its aftermath in terms of the literary scene. Verse history during this period emphasizes few outstanding actors, notably Walt Whitman, Herman Melville, and Emily Dickinson, all of whom supported the Union. As part of a failed attempt at national literature, Confederate verse produced during the Civil War is unacknowledged, it's scorned. And this mirrors the position of the South within the newly, northernly dominated American framework. So really, we can see Rose's absent poetry as a microcosm of the South's loss in general, and its erased literary history in particular. By abolishing Rose's verse with an Absalom Absalom, Faulkner intentionally emulates Confederate literary history. He wants to simulate metaphorically the erasure of the old Southern viewpoint. Although Rose's narrative voice and her poetry are both implicitly and explicitly silenced within the text, it's that very silence that causes us to take notice, to examine why her silence is at times more important than the words written in ink on the page. <laughs> 
So I hope this has provided a new way to look at Absalom Absalom and a new view of Rose and her poetry. So if you have any additional questions or need help thinking of essay questions about this novel, please feel free to write to me in the contact section of the Lit Chick Letters, uh, Lectures website or email me at carlysrosiak at gmail.com. Happy reading. <laughs>